Hey folks, it's Matt once again, and welcome back to another review of another house film. Like I said before, a while ago I got this from my good friend Efri. The limited edition House 2 Stories Blu-ray pack, which features House 1 and House 2. I recently did a review of House 1, and this is a great flick. It has a great sense of fun, mixed with horror... William Catt is wonderful as the lead. George Wendt, uh, he's in it a little bit throughout, but when he's there, he knocks out of the park. Wonderful creature effects, monsters. It's a haunted house movie, but it's nice that the lead character has a little bit of a journey that has a bit of adventure action aspect as well as horror. Just a very well done film. And I must not be alone because when this film came out it was uh, successful in fact New World Pictures it was their biggest hit until Steve Miner did his next film after this which was Soul Man with C. Thomas Howell and when that came out that became the biggest hit for New World Pictures and no I'm not shitting you but this was so much of a hit that New World wanted a sequel the next year and the person who wrote this, Ethan Wiley, said, hey, I would like to have a chance to direct. And so Sean Cunningham went, okay, you only have a few weeks to write it because it's got to get started real soon because it's got to come out the year after in 1987. And then you had House 2, the second story. It's getting weird. Kind of the same cover, but in this one, it's the finger on the doorbell, while here it's a key. And then for this release, they have another cover. Pretty good cover. Nice artwork there. You have R.E. Gross, who is in Soul Man, directed by Steve Miner. You have Jonathan Stark, who was the bad guy working with Chris Sarandon in the original Fright Night who got shot and then when he got staked he turned to goo and turned to bones and a wonderful special effect. But House 2 the second story I still would say I liked House 1 more with that horror humor mix and William Katz his character's journey to save his son and dealing with the Richard Mull corpse soldier but house 2 is a lot of fun it's a fun flick it's definitely more of a family friendly movie it's definitely more uh, more humor less horror it's definitely a I would say a gentler movie in a way softer movie I think that's the better way to put it but really enjoyed by Ethan Wiley I think he did a good job for a small budget it's a fun flick. It still has some really cool special effects. Uh, for example, this, this caterpillar mixed with a puppy. Uh, catter puppy. You see a little bit there. And actually, maybe I can show better pictures in this cool book that comes with the set. But that's a very cute design. I thought that was a really memorable creature effect for the movie. And let's see if there's a good best picture is this one here. I really like that. It made it say, hey, I want one. I want a cat or puppy. So I thought that was a really cool, very well done puppetry. Also, there's this prehistoric bird type creature, which I thought was also pretty cute. And I know there's a picture of that right here. I thought that was really cool. Again, very nice puppetry. And this has nothing to do with the first house story-wise. Nothing to do with William Cat, nothing to do with his character. It's not the same house. This is a different house. And I thought that was the better choice because William Cat, his story was told. Yeah, William Cat is in house four and his has the same name, but it's not the same character. And if that sounds confusing, I'll talk about that when I get to house four. But even though it's the same actor and same name of the character, it isn't the same character. Again, I'll get to that when I talk about 
for example, in the first house, he had a son. In house four, he has a teenage daughter. <laughs> but yeah, I'll get to that. But I thought it was the right choice because his story was done, finished, finito, and it's still about a haunted house, and it still has that you can do anything you want. So we're gonna hold this up, it gets a lot yellow. And then the one over here. The gist of the story, R. E. Gross, when he was a baby, his mom and dad gave him up, and this evil character here kills his parents. He doesn't know this yet, but we see it. It's about twenty five years later, and he goes into this house with his girlfriend. His girlfriend is actually Laura Parr Lincoln, who of course would be Tina in this film here, Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, in 1988, the year after this. I wonder if Sean S. Cunningham, well, I wonder if Sean S. Cunningham, who produced this, saw her and went, hmm, maybe... Because Kane Hodder also worked on this on the, as a stunt coordinator. He was a stunt coordinator in the first film. And he also has a cameo in this. But are you Gross, Love Part Lincoln, they arrive at this house. And soon after that, are you Gross's buddy, Jonathan Stark, arrives with this girl he's with. And that girl's going to get a contract with her band and her singing. Laura Pearl Lincoln's going to make that happen. And then her kind of boss is uh, Bill, I don't know what fuck up his last name, Mar Mayer, M-A-H-E-R. He's a comedian and he has a you know, politically incorrect, that show, Bill Maher. He, he has a small role in this. Anyway, R.U. Gross and Jonathan Stark, they look through R.U. Gross's ancestors and they talk this thing about his great-great-grandfather and that there's this skull and maybe the skull is buried with him so they dig him up and the great-great-grandfather comes back to life. Played by Royal Dono. Royal Dino? Dono? He's a guy I've seen in quite a few films. He was in Killer Clones from Outer Space in a small role. I remember him. The first time I saw him was in Ghoulies 2 as the magician, who's sort of the uncle of the lead guy, which I swear that guy in Ghoulies 2, the lead guy, looks like Johnny Depp's... <laughs> I swear he's related to Johnny Depp. I know he's not, but he looks like Johnny Depp. But anyway, I, I, when I reviewed Ghoulies 2, I mentioned that. But Royal Dono, he was a great character actor. And he has, brings a lot of warmth to this great-great-grandfather. Very kind soul. Very likable. And he starts telling them stories and tells about the skull. Yes, it is a crystal skull before Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Some would say it's a better movie. I love, I still love Indiana Jones 4, but I enjoy this film as well. Because this movie goes at a good pace. And the rest of the story is pretty much these two guys protecting the skull from evil that tries to get it. At one point, this big, humongous guy from back in the day that comes in. At one point, they go through this jungle where there's dinosaurs, some nice stop motion animation, and this big prehistoric creature. At another point, they gotta deal with this bird who takes the skull, and all you do is has to climb up and get the skull. At one point, they gotta deal with this guy and the finale, who used to be partners with Royal Dono, and back in the day, Royal Dono protected himself and shot this guy because the guy was gonna kill Royal Dono and take the skull, but now he's come back and he wants that skull. It goes at a very fast pace. It's only 80 minutes long. And R.E. Gross and Jonathan Stark, I thought they worked fine in the movie. Uh, they did well working together. They're taking the material as serious as it should be 
which is not too much at all, but at the same time, it's still... I didn't find it irritating or grating or annoying. I thought it was charming in a way. And I think I can see this is a film that maybe a lot of kids saw back in the day. I did not grow up with this. Like I did not grow up with the house films. But I, at least the first three I enjoy. Four I watched just recently. It's a piece of shit. But I like the first three including this one. And I saw this on DVD the first time way back. Ooh. 10 years ago maybe around there and it just goes to show you what you can do with a low budget like the first house again I think the makeup work on Roald Dano who he's waking up and he thought he was going to be rejuvenated but he still has you know, his bit of a zombie but kindler looking version while this one is definitely not and actually, Chris Wayless, who would go on to direct The Fly 2, and he had worked on effects for uh, many other films, like Gremlins. He actually had a hand in this, and he does get interviewed in Special Features, which I'll get to shortly. But it's one of those things where it has that... It's not really a horror film. If you go into this thing, it's going to be a horror film. You're going to be disappointed. It's more of a fun, soft adventure film. That's kind of what this is. Because this house, there's so many dimensions. Not as much as, say, Waxwork 2, which I love to death. I reviewed that film. Waxwork 2, that's one of those movies I grew up with. Waxwork 1 and 2. But still, it's like... A door opens, and at one point you're in a jungle. At the end, it's a ghost town in the West. And I thought that was a fun way to make a film bigger than what its budget is. And all the actors, I thought, were game for it. Laura Park Lincoln is the girlfriend. She's pretty much a bitch who's worried about her career. Leon leaves our lead guy, our hero. Uh, Jonathan Stark, it was cool to see him in another movie because all I remember him from is the original Fright Night. So, a very different character. In that one, he was very serious. I mean, he's worked with Chris Sarandon. And here, he's jokey. He's having fun. When someone goes, who's this Bozo the Clown? He's like, no, Bozo the Death Machine. <laughs> that made me laugh when he said that. Uh, are you gross? I thought you worked fine. I don't think he's as strong as William Cat. And then when you get to House 3, which is a very different tone, he's not as strong as Lance Henriksen, who's the lead in that. But are you gross did what he had to do. And, um, I'm not sure what other films he's been in. I'd have to look it up, but other than he was, I know he was in Soul Man. Which that's a film I honestly have not seen. I've heard a lot about it, and I know the premise about it, but I technically have not seen. So maybe one day I should. He does f what he has to do, and I thought he did fine. But yeah, all these guys keep coming out. There's this costume party happening. This big guy he knocks over Kane Hodder, who's in this gorilla suit for this costume party. And he just knocked over. That's Kane Hodder's little cameo. And Jonathan Stark just happens to have an Uzi, so they chase this big guy through this jungle. And Arya Gross sees the Uzi and says, What do I get? And he gives it this teeny tiny gun. Oh, thanks. And some nice stop motion work with the dinosaur in the jungle. Uh, Jonathan Stark at one point pulls out the switchblade, take your best shot. And the guy pulls out a sword. He's like, Yeah. And some very cute creatures. Again, the, the catter puppy, that's a very cute creature. The baby prehistoric bird that takes the skull and they ultimately bring it back with them. Very well, like I said, very well done puppetry. I miss this. Even low budget film can have good puppetry, like that creature there, or the catter puppy here. That's what I miss. You know, people wonder why people get so nostalgic for the 80s or even some of the early 90s films. And that's because 
you can't get more real than real. I mean, someone actually took the effort and time to build these sculptures, to master the art of puppetry, to master the designs with the tiny budget they have. As you tell, they put a lot of hard work into this stuff, and a lot of, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this. And to me, it shows to the point you'd have a scene like this where you have this cool prehistoric creature type and this catter puppy type. And you don't get a lot of that nowadays. You really don't. I'm not saying never, it's just rare. And I know people are probably tired of me mentioning this film, but I mention because it's the last big horror film I saw, Alien Covenant. I see all the CGI creatures that are just piss poor. And they don't have anything on stuff like this, which there's some heart and and same with the film itself. I mean, even as a goofy, silly movie, it has a good heart on its shoulder. And when you get to the ending, it's a bit heartwarming when you know this sort of weird type of family, you know, goes off in the distance to lead their lives. This you know kind of strange family involving this. I think that's why if this has a cult fan base, that's part of the reason as to why that has happened. I gotta mention John Ratzenberger, another guy from the TV show Cheers, just like George went in the in the first movie. And John Ratzenberger, he's in the film for yeah, man, it could be like five minutes. But when he's there, he makes an impression. And he's definitely memorable as an electrician. Just a lot of his dialogue, which apparently a lot of it he made up. Uh, he ad-libbed. And uh, I just liked his character. I thought he was a very fast-talking guy. That yeah, I just thought he was great. Let's see, he got some kind of alternate universe or something here. <laughs> I wish he was in the film more, honestly. I, I do. That's how much I liked him. I wish he was in the film more. Because I don't really have much criticisms for this. Just like I didn't really have any criticism for House, the original. I think they're two very good films. Again, I would put House 1 above it because I got a bit more into the story, William Cat's journey for what he was going through as a character. And I would put William Cat over All You Gross, but All You Gross is still like. It's just if, you, if I had to compare it between two, I like William Cat more. But but again, I don't want to think differently. I do think he did he did fine in the film. But John Rassenberg, I do wish he was in the flick more. It was a lot of fun. He had a good uh, sense of humor he brought to it. Uh, these characters here, they go in, find this virgin being sacrificed. They save her. You get a little bit of sword battles, sword fighting, and... Get to the end when this guy has to beat this bad guy who killed his parents, took the skull, has to save his friends, and very satisfied ending where he it just blows the shit out of the bad guy, fucks him up, blows him to pieces. And, I mean, that was pretty satisfying. I liked the effect of that. And, yeah, the, the ending, they go off to the sunset. I, this is one of those movies that, well, I'm showing the book, I should be showing the beach. It has a fun charm to it. You know, it's, a, it's an entertaining film, and they did a good job on the Blu-ray as well, at least the features-wise, because... You have an audio commentary. This is from the DVD. Because I remember I, I had the DVD of this, and this was from that DVD. Ryan director Ethan Wiley and producer Sean S. Cunningham, which is a bit dry, and it's not as fun as the commentary for the first movie. But the, the documentary is, is good. Ryan director Ethan Wiley, producer Sean S. Cunningham, stars R.E. Gross, Jonathan Stark, Laura Park Lincoln. Uh, and Devin DeVasquez, I think that's the Playboy Playmate who was the Virgin Sacrifice. I could be wrong. 
but I think that's her name. Harry Manfredini, who did the music for this, he did fine. Uh, special makeup creature effects artist Chris Whalers, Mike Smithson, visual effects supervisor Hoyt Ye Yeatman, Yeatman, and stunt coordinator Kane Hodder. A vintage making from back in the day, a still gallery, trailer, and a TV spot. So, you definitely know, get to know as much info as you can. Uh, I don't know if John Ratzenberger is still around. I know that's horrible to say, but I don't know if he's still around. If he is, I guess he didn't want to do an interview. Because George Wendt did an interview for House One, but unfortunately nothing from John Ratzenberger in, in this one. Again, I'm not sure if he's still with us or not. But... Again, it shows me what you can do with a low budget. What you can do with a low budgeted film. And this film didn't do as well as the first one. It still made a, a chunk of change for them to do House 3, aka the horror show. But I know this did not get as good of reviews because of the tone shift. Because it was made to be more silly, goofy. I think that, and that's I think the main reason why some people don't like it because they because they're too silly, too child friendly. But I liked it because it wasn't a carbon copy of the first one, and it tried to do its own thing. And I thought it did it fairly well. There were moments that made me chuckle, characters that I liked, the actors did their jobs, the effects were fun. Some very cute creatures in there. Moved at a good pace, not long enough that you know to get me bored, and again you know, has a good heart on its shoulder, has good intentions. So I enjoy House Two, the second story. I would put probably House, then House Three, the horror show because I really do like that one, and then House Two. House Four can kiss my ass, but is that the worst that I've seen? But yeah, I'll get to that. But yeah, if you're a fan of these movies, this is worth a pickup. Unless, I, well, I guess overseas there's a pack in the UK that has all four house films. And I believe it's region free. So if you want to go for that, feel free. At least my friend, you know what, I'm not 100% sure. Well, it is region free because my friend sent me the DVD copy of this. And this was region free because I was able to play in my US Blu-ray player. So, if you want to go for that, sure, but if you don't care about House 3 or 4, you have this because it has House 1 and 2 with a lot of good features, plus it has a very um, detailed book that goes through all four of the House films. And I'm a bit surprised they talk about House 3 and 4 since it's not in this collection, but I'm glad they do. Does they even talk about, you know, House 3, which will be next. I already reviewed it, but I'm doing the House films, and I might as well, because I like the film. But anyway, thanks for watching, take care, and we will see you later. Bye-bye.